فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم So the Prophet Sallallahu time the revelation was still going on Allah might tell the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi take this verse out of the Quran is abrogated keep this verse in the Quran this law has been passed now. Now you have to follow this rule and regulation. This previous rule and regulation, you don't have to follow no longer. Things were happening and there was that anticipation of the Prophet's side. So since things are still rolling and the, the, the revelation is still coming down, the Prophet didn't compile it. Whereas Abu Bakr's time, everything's finished now. Now this is a time where everything needs to come together. Now. And the Sahabas all agreed with him on this. There was no khilaf. Now. With the Prophet's death, Abu Bakr and the rest of the companions became certain that no further additions or aggregations would be revealed. And when they saw that there was, there was benefit to combining the Qur'an in a single mushaf, they did so. There is some disagreement among the scholars as to the number of mushafs distributed at the time of, of Uthman. Imam Abu Amr al-Dani Abu Amr al-Dani is a teacher of Imam al-Shatibi, Abu al-Qasim al-Shatibi. You know the kitab, Hirz al-Amani wa Wajhu al-Tahani. Are you with me? The kitab Hirz al-Amani wa Wajhu al-Tahani which is called al fiyat al-Shatibiyah which people memorize he's actually took it from the kitab written by Taysir by Abu Amr al-Dani that's where he made the nadm from and the kitab that I was talking about Aqilatu Aqilatu al-Atrab which I said we're going to study which is the rasm of the Mus'haf is also Imam al-Shatibi's work which he summarized it from whose book? His teacher Abu Amr al-Dani Rahimahullah Naam and the book he took is the Kitab Aqilatul Atrab is a summary of the Al Muqni. It's, it's, it's a summary of the Muqni that was written by Abu Amr al Dani. Abu Amr al Dani worked on this stuff. So now. He states that most of the scholars are of the opinion that the Quran contains the Sunnah of the Prophet and that the and kept the fourth copy with himself in Medina. Scholars differed of how Abu Uthman, how many copies did he make? Some said he only, he only took four and he sent it to the four headquarters of the Muslim world. The four main branches in the Muslim world. And that was Basra, Kufa, Sham, and he kept one with himself in Medina. So those were the four big, and every, every station was taking it from there. That's where the, it was kept. That's one view. And that's the view of Abu Amr al-Dani, rahimahullah. The other one is the view of Abu Hatim al-Sijistani. Abu Hatim al-Sijistani, or on the other hand, holds the opinion that Uthman made seven copies of the Mus'haf and sent one to Mecca, one to Damascus, one to Damascus, one to Yemen, one to Bahrain, one to Basra, one to Kufa, and one to kept one in Medina with himself. This is a brief summary of that which relates to the history of the compilation of the Qur'an and there are many authentic narrations regarding the Sufi al Bukhari. There are three views of pronouncing the Mus'haf, the word Mus'haf. One is Mus'haf, two, Mis'haf, three, Mas'haf. Of the three pronunciations, Mus'haf and Mis'haf are the most popular. Abu Ja'far and Nahas and others, however, are known to have used the pronunciation Mas'haf, section. Read, read it, don't worry. I'm not going to read that. Scholars agree that it is recommended to inscribe the Mus'haf in beautiful handwriting that is clear and legible without extending the script or hanging it on the walls or anywhere else. The scholars have also stated that it is recommended to place dots and vowels on the letters in order to avoid mispronunciation and distortion. A Sha'bi and a Nakhai dislike that dots be placed on the letters during their time for fear of it leading to distortion as dots were not used at the time of the Prophet Today, however, there is no fear of distortion as the Qur'an is ever more widespread and so there is nothing wrong with this practice nor should it be prevented under the pretext that it is a newly innovative matter. It is indeed a praiseworthy innovation much like the categorization of knowledge into different disciplines building schools and establishing organizations and associations, etc. And Allah knows best. Section. It is not permissible to write the Qur'an with anything that is impure. According to our school of thought, it is disliked that the Qur'an be written on walls and we have already made mention of Atar's opinion on this issue. We have also mentioned that there is nothing wrong with eating food upon, 
upon which the Quran has been written. And that would and that is his dislike to burn a piece of wood with the Quran written on it. Section. Muslims, uh, with regard to the scholars specifically, unanimously agree that it is obligatory to protect the Mus'haf and honor it. Or our companions have stated that if a Muslim were to throw the Quran, Allah forbid, into the trash or uh, rubbish, he would become an apostate immediately. It is also impermissible to use the Quran as a pillow, for instance. Indeed, it is impermissible to use rare books of knowledge in such ma manner as well. It is recommended that one stand up upon being presented with the Mus'haf. This, this is in view of the opinion that it is recommended to stand up in honor of the scholars, the righteous, and the people of honor. Such an honor is more befitting of the Qur'an, so the act itself would be considered even more recommended. So if somebody gives you the Mus'haf, you stand up when you're taking it from them. Just like if a scholar, a person of knowledge came to you, you stand up for them. He's saying that the Qur'an is more befitting for you to stand up for. Are you? That's, a, that's not an opinion that's strong. Are you? That's not a strong opinion. Are you? As mentioned, I have stated that different proofs for the recommendation of standing up in honor of others in a piece that I have compiled on this topic. It is narrated in Musnad al darmi with an authentic chain of narration from Ibi Abi Mulika. Mulika. Mulika, that Ikrima ibn Abi Jahl, may Allah be pleased with him, used to place the Mus'haf on his face and say, The book of my Lord, the book of my Lord. So some people took from that you can kiss the Mus'haf. Section. It is impermissible to travel with the Mus'haf to enemy territory if there is fear that it may fall into their hands. Proof of this comes from the popular hadith found in the, in the two authentic books that state that the Prophet said and commanded against traveling to the enemy land with the Qur'an. So you're not allowed to take the Qur'an to the lands of the disbelievers. Why? Because of the fact that they may get hold of it. This is the hadith of the Prophet. That the Prophet ﷺ, he said that it's prohibited to travel with the Qur'an to the land of the disbelievers. But then what, how, does it, how do we reconcile between that and this today's action? You will mention it, eh? It is not permissible to sell a copy of the Mus'haf to a Christian or Jew with whom we have a treaty with. If a sale does take place, however, there are two opinions regarding its validity according to Imam Shafi. The more correct of the two is that it is not valid and the second is that it is valid, but the owner must be ordered to give up his ownership immediately thereafter. Children who have not reached an age at which they may discriminate between right and wrong and the insane are not allowed to carry the Mus'haf for fear that they may mistreat it. The duty of preventing them from carrying the Mus'haf is compulsory upon the guardian and anyone seeing them carrying it. So when a Mus'haf is not just being given to a child and say, oh, do what you want with it. When he's given, the parent watches him and makes sure we well, hold it properly. You know, he's observed. He's not just given the Mus'haf and he tears it up as he wishes, he throws it, he runs away. You can't just do that with the Qur'an with the kids. But you do give it to them and you, you observe them and you guard them. Now, It is permissible for an individual in a state of ritual impurity to touch the Mus'haf or carry it, whether he carries it with the aid of a, with the aid of a clasp or anything else, or whether he touches it, touches the writing itself, or the commentary in its margins, or touches its cover. It is also impermissible. Sorry, I read it wrong. Section. It is impermissible for an individual in a state of ritual impurity to touch the Mus'haf to carry it, whether he carries it with the aid of a clasp or anything else, or whether he touches the writing itself or commentary in its margins or touches its cover. It is also impermissible for one in, an, in a state of ritual impurity to touch a piece of skin, a cover, or a box containing the Mus'haf. This is our chosen opinion. Some, however, have said that these three items are excluded from the ruling on not touching the Mus'haf. But this is a weak opinion. Also, So they say that if a woman is on a menses, for instance, and she wants to read the Qur'an, she has to read it with the help of somebody. So it should be somebody who holds the Mus'haf for her, somebody who turns the pages over for her, she can't touch it. She can't touch it. Other scholars, they said that if she used an object to touch it, she's allowed to. She's permitted. Now. Also, if the Qur'an is written on a board or panel, the same rulings apply whether that which is written 
is a lot, a little, or even part of a verse written for the purpose of teaching section. There are two opinions among our companions regarding the permissibility of turning the pages of the Mus'haf using a stick or something similar for one in the state of ritual impurity or for a menstruating woman. The more correct of the two opinions is that it is permissible. This is, a view of the, this is the view of our companions from Iraq, as they do not consider this to be touching a Mus'haf or carrying it. The other opinion is that it is impermissible because it is considered carrying a sheet upon which the Mus'haf is written. And carrying one sheet is tantamount to carrying the entire Mus'haf in this regard. <laughs> As for permissibility of using one's sleeves to turn the pages of the Mus'haf, our companions are agreed that this is impermissible. Some of our companions, however, have erred and stated that there is a second opinion on this matter. But the correct view is that it is absolutely prohibited and turning the pages in this manner is essentially done with the hand and not with the sleeves. Section. It is impermissible for an individual in a state of minor or major, minor or major ritual impurity to touch or hold a paper upon which he is writing the Mus'haf. There are three opinions with regard to the permissibility of writing the Mus'haf without touching or holding what is being held or what it is being written on. The more correct of these opinions is that it is permissible. The second is that it is impermissible and the third is that it is permissible for one in a state of minor ritual impurity and not for one in a state of major ritual impurity. Section. If a person in the state of minor or major ritual impurity or a menstruating woman touches or carries the book of fiqh or any other book of Islamic knowledge that contains Qur'an or a garment that is embroidered with the verses of the Qur'an or dirhams or dinars engraved with the Qur'an or carries a set of items that include the Qur'an or touches the wall or sweets or bread with Qur'an written on them, the correct, the correct opinion is that this is permissible as none of these constitute a mushaf. The other opinion is that it is impermissible. In his book, Al-Hawi, Al-Hawi. Al-Hawi the most renowned of judges, uh, Abu, Abu Al-Hassan Al-Mawardi. 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 You said the last time not to say that, the most renowned of judges. Yeah, that's incorrect. Aqad al-Qudat, eh? it's ajeeb, that's what they call him. Abu Al-Hassan Al-Mawardi states, it is permissible to touch a garment embroidered with Qur'an, but it, it, it is not permissible to wear it according to the consensus of the scholars, as the purpose behind wearing such a garment is to seek its blessing. This opinion, however, is weak, and I have not seen anyone agreeing with him. Rather, Sheikh Abu, Muh- Abu Muhammad al juwaini and others have stated that wearing such a garment is permissible, and this is the correct view on the matter. Allah knows best. Carrying or touching books of tafsir is impermissible for those in a state of ritual and impurity. If they contain more Qur'an than commentary, but if the commentary is more volum- voluminous, voluminous than the Qur'an, which is most often in the case, then there are three opinions regarding the permissibility of carrying or touching these books. The correct opinion is that it is permissible. The second is that it is impermissible. And the third is that states that if the Qur'an is written using different ink, or a different thickness to the commentary, it is not permissible. If, um, now this is dividing the books of tafsir into two. Some books of tafsir, they have more Qur'an, then they have more commentary on it. So he says that if it has more Qur'an and then, then more commentary, then this is close to a mushaf, then it's haram. For a person who is on a made it. What about if the mushaf is less, the Qur'an is less, there's more commentary. It's a big book, there's more commentary of a scholar on it. He says there's three views. The first one is that it's not haram. The second one is that it's haram. And the third one is if the Quran is written in a clear writing or red or what different color, it's haram. That's the view he takes. And as we know, these are all based upon the argument that a woman or a person in their major, impu- major impurity, they are not allowed to touch the mushaf. It goes back to this mis'ala. Now. If we hold this last view to be correct, it would be impermissible to touch or hold a tafsir that contained both Qur'an and commentary in equal amounts. Uh-huh. Among our companions, the author of, uh, of Tatima, Tatima. Tatima stated that even if we assume this to be permissible, it must be held as disliked. 
It is permissible to touch books that contain traditions of the Prophet وسلم, if they do not contain any verses from the Qur'an, but it is still better that this is done while in a state of ritual purity. If they do not contain verses from the Qur'an, it is still permissible according to our view, but it is disliked. What about the books of Hadith? Now he talks about the books of Hadith. He says that the books of Hadith, if there's no verses of the Qur'an in it, it's not haram for you to touch it. But he said, what's more befitting is that you don't touch it and you stay in a state of impurity. But if there are ayat in the Quran, it's not haram to touch it. And this is the madhab that the Shaykh Rahimahullah Ta'ala is upon and is disliked. And there's also another opinion within the Shafi'i madhab, which is that it's haram. And that's what's mentioned in the books of fiqh. What about if the verse is abrogated? It used to be a verse. Can you touch it? He talks about that now. It is permissible to touch or hold that which contains verse that have verses that have been abrogated in terms of recitation, but not in terms of ruling. Like the ayah that used to be read is no longer in the Quran anymore. As Shaykhu wa Shaykhatu ida zana ya farjumu huma albatta nakara min Allah. That verse used to be read. It used to be part of the Quran. It's no longer in the Quran. It's been taken out of the Quran. So it's abrogated in terms of its wording, not its meaning. Its meaning is, inf- is, is implemented. Now. Um, an example, if an elderly married man or an elderly woman commit adultery, then stone them to death. Our companions have also stated that the same ruling applies to touching or carrying the Torah, the Torah or the Bible. So th- he says this is not a problem now. Yeah, this is not a problem, you can touch it even though you're in a state of impurity, because the eye is abrogated in terms of its wording, you're allowed to touch it. Just like you're allowed to touch the Torah and the Injil, are they not abrogated? They are abrogated. You can touch them without any state of purity. So if a person passes you a Bible and you're on menstruation, you can take it from them. That's what he's saying. Section. If there is an inexcusable amount of impurity upon someone who is otherwise in a state of ritual impurity, who is in a state of ritual purity, it is impermissible for them to touch the most hurtful the parts of the body that contains the incessant amount of impurity. Somebody is pure, he's clean, he's on, he's clean, but something very impure fooled on fell in him. Are you there? Something impure touched him, and it's a lot in quantity. So he's saying here that he shouldn't touch it in the part of his body which is impure. He's not allowed to touch it on that part. Are you? There is, however, nothing wrong with touching a mushaf with the clean parts of the body according to the correct and more popular opinion chosen by the majority of our companions and other great scholars. Among our companions, however, Abu Qasim al-Sayyimariyu 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 described this as impermissible but was refuted by the Shafi'i scholars and the Qadi Abu Tayyib who stated that his Abu Qasim statement goes against and is thus rejected by the consensus of the scholars. Some of our companions are of the view that this practice is disliked but the chosen meaning of apparently more correct but the chosen opinion is that it is not disliked. Session. A person who has performed tayammum Due to lack of water, is permitted. What, now he's going to go into the issue of, I can't find water, am I allowed to use tayammum? Am I allowed to do tayammum to touch the mushaf? What's the ruling regarding this? Has performed tayammum due to Start again. Anyone can't find? Section. A person who has performed tayammum due to lack of water is permitted to touch the mushaf regardless of whether he has made tayammum for the purpose of performing prayers or any other legitimate reason. So if a person doesn't have water and they can't do wudu, so what do they do? They do tayammum. That tayammum can either be for salah or that tayammum can be for other than the salah. It can be for the purpose of wanting to read the Quran. Either, whichever of the cases it may be, the person is allowed to what? He's allowed to touch the mushaf, he's saying. One who is unable to find water or dust must pray in whatever state he is in, but m- must not touch the mushaf as long as he is in a state of ritual impurity. Such an individual is only allowed to pray in the state due to the necessity of performing prayers in their allotted times. 
if the individual is carrying the mushaf on him and cannot find anyone to keep it for him, nor is able to nor is able to perform ablution, it is permissible for him to carry the mushaf as this is this, this is this, as this is dictated by necessity. Mm -hmm. Regarding the situation, Badi Abu Tayyib stated that tayyumum is not mandatory for him, the individual in the situation described previously. This is, however, a questionable view, and the correct view is that tayyumum is mandatory for such an individual. If in such a situation one fears that the mushaf... So what about if you believe that the mushaf is going to burn, or you believe that the, the mushaf is going to be thrown into a water? If you believe that, or a najas is going to happen to the mushaf, then the person is allowed to take the mushaf. What is he allowed to do? He's allowed to take the mushaf. Even if he's on a major impurity, he's allowed to take the mushaf and he's allowed to teach. He's sorry, he's not allowed to teach, so he's allowed to take it. So you believe that the mushaf is going to burn, or it's going to what? It's going to fall into water. Are you with me? If it's this situation, then the person is allowed to take the, touch the mushaf even though he's on upon, upon major impurity. Why? Because it's darura necessity. Now, section. There are two opinions among our companions as to whether it is mandatory for a teacher or guardian to order a discerning child to perform wudu for the purpose of touching the mushaf or, or a writing board from which he is reading the Quran. The more correct of these views is that it is not permissible due to the due to the hardship entailed by in enjoying this. Section. It is permissible to buy and sell the mushaf and it is not disliked to buy it. As for it being disliked to sell it, our companions hold two views and the more correct view uh, and the, the more correct of which is that it is disliked, which is the opinion explicitly stated by Imam Shafi. Among those who held who held that neither buying among those who held that neither buying it nor selling it is disliked were Al Hassan al Basri Ikrima and Al Hakim ibn Utayba. It is also narrated that Ibn Abbas held this view. All of these scholars they believed buying and selling it are both not disliked. And then now he's gonna mention the view of the groups of scholars who disliked buying and selling it. Some scholars are reported to have disliked both selling it and buying it. And Ibn, Ibn al mundir reported this to be the view of al qama Ibn Sirin, al Nikhayi, Shurei, Masrur, and Abu and Abdullah ibn Yazid. Abdullah ibn Zaid. Abdullah ibn Zaid, yeah. Abdullah ibn Zaid. It is narrated that Ibn Umar and Abi Abi Musa al Ash'ari strongly disagreed with selling it. While others saw that it was acceptable to buy it. The only Abdullah ibn Umar used to say, fi al -masahif. I wish hands were, hands were cut for those who were selling the masahif. While others saw that it was acceptable to buy it and only disliked that it was being sold. Ibn al mundir reported this to be the opinion of Ibn Abbas, Sa'id ibn, Sa ibn Jubayr, Imam Ahmed and Ishaq ibn Rahawayn. May Allah be pleased with them all and Allah knows best. The author then says at the ending of his book, وَقَدْ بَسَطْتُ بَيَانَهُ He says, وَهَذَا آخِرُ مَا تَيَسَّرَى مِنْ هَذَا الْكِتَابِ Imam al-Nawi concludes the book by saying, this is all that I was able to go through in his book. وَهُوَ نُبْدَةٌ مُخْتَصَرَةٌ بِالنِّسْبَةِ إِلَىٰ أَدَبِ الْقُرَّاءِ And this book is a very summarized portion of the etiquettes of the one who's reading the Qur'an. وَلَكِنْ حَمَلَنِي عَلَى اخْتِصَارِي مَا ذَكَرْتُ فِي أَوَلِ الْكِتَابِ And the reason why I summarized this book and I made it this summarized is because what I mentioned at the beginning of the book. Wallah as'al and I ask Allah and naf'a that he benefits us. Al-amima bihi li wa li ahbabi. And Allah encompasses us and benefit all of us. Me and those who I love. Wa li kulli nadirin fihi and everyone who looked into this book. Wa sa'il al-muslimin and all of the Muslims in this world and the hereafter. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen and praises to Allah. Hamdan yuwafi ni'amahu. A hamd that will fulfill his blessings. وَيُكَافِئَ مَزِيدَهُ وَصَلَاةُ وَسَلَامُهُ عَلَىٰ وَسَلَاةُهُ وَسَلَامُهُ الْأَكْمَلَانِ عَلَىٰ سَيِّدِنَا مُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِهِ وَأَصْحَابِهِ أَجْمَعِينَ And the author finished the writing of this book on the following date. 
He said, He started compiling this book on Thursday when it was Athani Ashara. It was on the 12th of the month of Shahr Rabi' al Awwal. In the month of Rabi' al Awwal, when the year was what? Sanata Sittin wa Sittina wa Sittimi'a, 666. That's what the year was. And he said, I finished it. Min Jum'ihi on a Friday, Sabihat al Khamisi, the morning of a Thursday, a Thalith min Shahri, Rabi' al Akhiri, the third of the month of Rabi' al Akhir, when the year was Sanata Sittin wa Sittina wa Sittimiya, 666. And we say, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestow his never ending mess, uh, mercy upon Al Imam al Nawawiyu. And we also say, وَإِن تَجِدْ عَيْبًا فَسُدُّ الْخَلَلَ فَجَلَّ مَنْ لَا عَيْبًا فِيهِ وَعَلَى If you saw any mistakes in our explanation and our dealings with the book, if you saw that and we did any shortcomings, then I will say to you all, فَسُدُّ الْخَلَلَ Block and close that mistake of mine. فَجَلَّ مَنْ لَا عَيْبًا Noble is the one who has no mistakes and he is above, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أقول ما تسمعون واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين من كل ذنب فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم إن شاء الله تعالى tomorrow we're going to start the explanation of the other book الإصباح in the morning 7 o'clock إن شاء الله تعالى question and answers until 12 o'clock sisters if you have any questions put your write your questions and pass it on إن شاء الله تعالى